Because what happens is with childhood is we create our identities then. And from our identities, we create the roles that we play within our life. You know, we create the way that we should interact. We create the way that we should feel. Welcome to the Bro Novo Podcast. The podcast that models healthy communication for men, empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Welcome to the show, everybody. I have an awesome guest for you this week. Before I get there, I want to remind you to check out the form linked in the show notes to let me know what you want to hear about. Help me help you with your own self-development and your intellectual and educational expansion, and you can help grow the show as well. My guest this week is Lily Walford. Lily is an international dating coach who enables busy professionals to date safely and successfully using CIA-level behavioral psychology, profiling, and body language frameworks. We have a great discussion about her origin story and her path to this career, how to handle relationships with narcissists, and a lot of practical tips for reading body language to be successful in your personal and professional life. Thanks so much to Lily. I learned a lot from this episode, and I know you will too. Enjoy the show. And we're live. Good afternoon, Lily. How you doing? <laughs> I'm great, thank you. How are you? <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, it's a uh, the sun is yet to rise here in California, so I'm, I'm getting after it early. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's rather early for you. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're in the afternoon here over in the UK, so it's not so bad. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so we were just talking, getting some background info. I'm really interested to hear about your your life and the work you do. If you could give a quick synopsis of of your consultancy, what would you say that you specialize in? Yeah, so uh, we specialize in relationships and dating, and we use behavioral psychology and behavioral profiling to help people meet the one. Nice. Okay. Meet the one. So there's a specific end goal to to find love, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Because I think so many people, you know, want to be able to find love, but not many people know actually how to go ahead and do that. And the dating industry has changed so much over the last 10, 20 years. And uh, people haven't really come to, you know, got the grips of actually how to use it in a way where they can meet someone for a lasting relationship. Nice. Awesome. And what uh, along your path brought you to this point where you had an interest in coaching and, and why this field of work? Yeah, gosh. So uh, the funny thing is I actually started out as an accountant. So I literally was working with Fortune 500 companies, international companies and doing things like group accounting and yeah, crazy, crazy stuff like a lifetime ago. But back then I was going into relationships and, you know, one in particular where it was really narcissistic, um, you know, borderline psychopathic And even after that relationship had ended, I was stalked for five years. And it kind of got me into this space where I was thinking, okay, what is it that actually creates a healthy relationship and how can people go ahead and get it? Because even after that relationship, I'd went into another narcissistic relationship and another not so great relationship. And it was just terrible. And you kind of get, you you kind of like start doing the whole self-reflection of like, oh gosh, isn't me. And I sort of looked at my childhood, I looked at my career and thought, well, I've had a great childhood, got a great career. I I believe I'm intelligent. And, um, uh, you know, you start questioning, okay, what is it that actually creates that healthy relationship or how can you even find it? And uh, it was actually back in uh, 2017, I went through a massive breakup And I thought that I was with the one. We had an amazing house, two brand new cars, lived in a lovely place in in the city. And um, that relationship just broke down within the weekend. So within the weekend, I'd, um, you know, lost my relationship. I'd moved house, I moved cities, I changed jobs. And it got me to that stage of questioning, you know, again, what is it that makes a healthy relationship? And I started looking into things like NLP. So within one year, I became an NLP master practitioner, a life coach, a hypnotherapist, um, public speaker, launched a business and I was working full time. But the interesting thing is, even through that, I realized it wasn't enough. And this is when I actually met someone called Chase Hughes. 
So, and the reason why I found out it wasn't enough was I went on a dating site and, um, and someone had actually from just from my net, my first name and my profile picture and just a couple of messages exchanged, they decided to send me a bunch of roses to my home address, which I did not give them. They managed to find my home address just through Jeez. first name. Yeah. And it made me realize like, oh gosh, okay, well, if this can happen to me, this can happen to my clients. You know, how do I prevent this? How do I keep people safe? How can I stop people from interacting with those dangerous personality types? And that's actually how I got introduced to Chase. So within a few messages, Chase had let me know exactly how to stop this person from pursuing me. Because the truth is, if you've got someone who's a stalker or has narcissistic or psychopathic tendencies, if you block them, it creates a game. So it's like, okay, if you block them on Messenger or something like that, great, they're going to text you. Okay, if you block them, um, te- you know, texting you, they're going to call you from another phone. And it's like this weird game of cat and mouse that goes along. So I knew from this I needed to be able to find a way to disarm, you know, someone from pursuing me further. And literally within a few messages with this person online, they suddenly didn't want to pursue me anymore. And I wasn't rude to them. I didn't say, you need to stop messaging me or that was really wrong of you of doing this. Nothing confrontational. But it was a special way to, from profiling that person to know exactly what I needed to say to disarm them from wanting to pursue me. And that's when I was absolutely freaking hooked. I needed to learn more about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, what? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so this guy's called Chase. Cool. He's literally got like $30 million worth of government-backed research from training um, people from like military operatives, CIA operatives, to keep them safe in life or death situations. So through his training, we actually learned how to profile people within six minutes or less and also to read people better than a polygraph machine. And the funny thing is, after learning all that, three weeks later, I found myself in the relationship that I'm still in now. Wow, lovely. <laughs> so it works. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you gone back and applied that framework to your current relationship kind of in retrospect? It's it's interesting, actually. So basically, I, I learned a lot through obviously the NLP side of things, learned a lot through being able to profile people and understand through the profiling who's actually compatible with people. And that's how I used it. I played, I almost played guinea pig of myself first <laughs> um, right. to see, okay, is this person serious about me? Great. I can see if they're saying yes to a long-term relationship or not and read their body language to see if they're being completely open and truthful. It was really, really interesting being able to use that. And over the years, I've developed it in such a way where my clients think it's 72% of them are meeting the one within three months with work, of working with me. How big is that data set? Yeah, so I've worked with over, over 100 clients. So we've developed a framework now. So our most recent program is the Elite Love Program. And that's been... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> but then, but Elite the thing, love. Yeah. And the thing I love about it is what we actually do as well with people who meet um, someone on the program, we actually bring their partners onto the program as well. So they'll actually go through the program together and build their relationship from the same nice. foundations. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, it's not like the whole pickup artist industry or, you know, say these 10 things to make them fall in love with you or or anything manipulative. It's like, look, we want you to have, we want you to have the truth in in the relationship because the more that you see the truth, the more that you're informed, the better that you can make the right decisions for yourself and also that relationship. Totally. And the more that we understand about what we're bringing to any engagement, it's going to be a healthier one for everyone and mm-hmm. we'll be able to communicate our needs better and, uh, and uh, speak up when they're not being met. Exactly. So that's just an incredible story, Lily. The First of all, being stalked for five years sounds terrifying. <laughs> it was an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I think that might be, you know, a male privilege thing perhaps of not understanding the realities of what goes on day to day. Yeah, I think the truth of that situation is, is that it was just someone who was narcissistic. 
And mm. again, you know, you can get men and, and female narcissists. And what we find is with the true narcissist, because I know that narcissist is such, is such a buzzword at the moment, but true narcissist, the empathy part of the brain is actually underdeveloped. So asking them to feel empathy or anything like that is almost like asking a fish to walk. So the way they actually view people is like possessions, like, you know, resources, like a pen or something like that. They they learn how to use it rather than how to connect with it. So when that resource is no longer there through a breakup, they want to find ways to be able to get that resource back to them because it's a control element. Wow. That's a great analogy. <laughs> how do how do narcissists play out in other dyads? So in a family example or in the workplace, those are the other two ones uh, that jump out immediately. Yeah. So there's, there's a few different ways that you can tell. So for example, with a narcissist, you have two different types. So you've got one that's quite grandiose and loves to be able to be center of attention, get the status, get the power, get the control. The other one's more victim mentality. So the other one's like, oh, I'm no good at this. And they're looking for the adulation through that. Or I've done all this to so many people. Look how great I am. And doing things quite, you know, covertly, hence covert narcissist. But um, what you tend to find with them is, number one, they won't take accountability. So it's never their fault. They always look at blaming the situation or blaming the people around them. So it's almost like a Teflon shoulder effect. (laughs) Um, uh, um, So that tends to be a huge one that we tend to find. And the other thing as well is when they're looking for control, it's looking for control without logic. So it's looking for control for the sake of having control. So if you ever get to a stage of questioning, why are we doing things this way? Or, you know, why have you asked me to do this? It's like, because I told you so. Just go and do it. You know, it's, it, tends to, it tends to be no logic behind it. It's just for the sake of getting, this, getting someone to go ahead and do something. Interesting. So I, I had never realized that the power dynamic is so key to the narcissistic experience. I, I, with that word, I always associated more just self-absorption. Mm-hmm. And yeah. thinking that one is the, you know, the best. But it sounds like there's also a lot of manipulation going on. Yeah, hugely. I mean, um, we we refer to narcissistic relationships as, as a two-person cult. Because what you actually have that happen in a narcissistic relationship is they'll slowly work against that person's sense of self. So, for example, oh, you're too needy. Oh, you're not good enough or oh, you're so, aren't you clever enough to be able to see things from this point of view and it's wow. quite manipulative kind of language yeah so what you tend to find is the more that you berate someone even if it's in a slow way you think about a relationship for 20 years or something like that that's gonna have a huge psychological impact and when you have someone who has really low self-esteem it becomes easier to control them And that's kind of their way of being able to keep someone there. Because if that person feels worthless, they're not going to feel like they're able to go and get a new relationship. They're not going to feel like they're able to to go and find a connection elsewhere. So what you end up having as well is that person's sense of identity is, you know, crushed, but also they're left questioning their own emotions and their own feelings and their own logic. So even when someone comes out of that relationship, they're in this place of really trying to find themselves and really trying to find, okay, what makes themselves tick or are they okay to feel this emotion or, you know, the five minute decision it suddenly takes to go and buy a certain brand of milk, you know, because they're confused and used to rely on the narcissist logic. So it's really about them, um, you know, when we talk about narcissistic relationships, the psychological abuse element without even the physical abuse can be absolutely huge for people to get over. That makes sense. And is it's really interesting just reacting to all this information. I, I feel tense maybe, or my body does. Is, it's kind of intimidating to hear all of this, but there's a power in having it laid out. And I imagine for people who are in, that situation, having someone objectively explain, this is what you're experiencing. This is, these are the tendencies of somebody with this disposition and vitally, here's how you can get out of it. So I would say, what are the, I guess, core tenets of your 
your model and how do you how do you go about helping someone who finds themselves in the situation so the important thing for people who are in a narcissistic relationship the truth is if they're in that relationship it only they can make that decision if they're going to leave or not and that's really really important because it's it's quite funny when people are in that relationship it's it's very psychologically controlling like i said it's very, it's very cult like so for example i had someone who recently went through a breakup with a narcissist but they had a holiday booked with them and they were debating whether to still go on the holiday and because there's that emotional attachment and the emotional attachment tends to be more exaggerated than what it would be in a healthy relationship because there's something called emotional fractionation that happens so this is where we have like the push pull effect where someone's like oh I love you and all these different things they're putting all the love bombing out there so literally the chemicals in the brain go super high it's more addictive than like class a drugs and then all of a sudden it's withdrawn that person just gives the cold shoulder so when you have multiple of these events it creates this really strong addiction and pattern to that person so you're not just breaking down the elements of the identity or anything like that you're also breaking down that addiction to that person which can be highly highly um intensive and Sounds difficult yeah. yeah so this is why i said it, it's really important for them to get to that place of making that decision to leave the other side of things i mean chase and i developed a a program on how to identify and disarm narcissists there's not a one-size-fits-all approach because a little bit like the profiling when you profile someone you understand their needs and fears because when you understand the needs and fears you understand what drives their behavior what they're working towards and what they're trying to escape from and when you have that especially for a narcissist you understand what's actually going to drive their behavior and what's going to deter it. So with that, that's what we tend to look at. We look at those elements so people can get out of the relationships or if they're going for a divorce, I had one person going for a divorce and um, a highly, highly controlling narcissist. But it was amazing because through our work together, not only did she, was she able to regain control over that situation, but even her kids actually learned some of the benefits of using some of the techniques. I mean, we've just had the school holidays here in the UK and, um, you know, the kids have just had an absolutely amazing school holiday with their dad. You know, they've been able to actually learn how to deal with his behaviours, but in a way where they, they're benefiting rather than actually getting, you know, childhood trauma or things like that, which can obviously have a huge implication on their future relationships as well. So it's it's very interesting. Totally. That that is and it sounds like your approach is not outcasting the narcissistic person but rather finding a way to work within that context and make it a positive for the people who love that person. Yeah, exactly because I think what people really struggle with is, you know, like I kind of use the analogy of um, a fish not being able to walk as a narcissist not being able to, you know, feel or feel empathy. People feel angry. It's like, well, you know, if you think about it, you can't feel angry with a fish that can't walk. It's a bit unfair, you know, <laughs> the ability is not there to be able to do it. So when people are able to see that, they're able to accept the person for who they are. They're able to accept, okay, that person can't feel, that person can't connect with me in the same way. And it's not to say it's good or bad, but it means that there's going to be these tendencies or these symptoms. So what it is going to mean that there's more needs for boundaries and and also self-awareness of being able to look after yourself in that situation and also to, to be able to get the best out of that situation or that interaction so for example if you've got a boss or you've got a, a um, you know family member as a narcissist well you know you last thing you want to do is say okay I need to cut them out of my life or I need to avoid them or <laughs> it's not always that simple but knowing how to get the best out of those situations rather than feeling angry because they can't show up in the way that you need them to is a very different story absolutely and that's a powerful 
philosophy for a lot of relationships in life, including with ourselves. Yeah. Totally. Because there are times where, you know, where we fall short and can't, or I can only speak for myself, where I fall short and can't meet the goals I set or do something that I regret later. But I think it's this the idea of we're all, we're all people, we're all human and humans are valuable and irrational. <laughs> yeah. You think it's, about how powerful self-acceptance is. Because often, you know, you think about the whole, you know, mental health industry. You know, if people feel depressed, it's because they're, they've not accepted where they are and they're constantly looking back. If you've got people feeling anxiety, you know, it's, it's the fear of not being able to reach their goals in the future. And it all, it's all based on the way, you know, the way that you feel about your situation within the moment. And also the way that you perceive yourself and the role that you play. And again, this um, this beautifully interacts with um, with our childhood, because what happens is with childhood is we actually, you know, we create our identities then. And from our identities, we create the roles that we play within our life. You know, we create the way that we should interact. We create the way that we should feel you know, emotionally. So for example, if you were praised for being the people pleaser as a child, being the goody two shoes, getting the good grades and all these different things, you know, well, that's going to be something that's going to show up in, in you as an adult through your work, through your friendships, your everything. Or if you were someone who's highly independent, or if you were someone who is a bit of a victim, you know, that child that always falls over, scratches their knee and screams lots for their parents to come and pick them up. Um, you know, there's all these different behaviors and emotions that, that these ch- children associate with their identity and it plays out in their relationships as they grow up. Totally. That's a whole topic that I actually want to understand a lot more is how do childhood experiences influence the person I am now? And, you know, what are the things from the adults in my life that I absorbed that are influencing me that I haven't identified yet. That's all really rich self-work I feel. Yeah. And (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I guess what, what have you observed? What are the main childhood experiences that end up impacting these adults years and years later? If you can see any uh, patterns, everything literally (laughs) everything i mean you know know, there's things like if that child did something wrong how did their parents react did they go oh my gosh what have you done or did they turn around and say whoops okay let's just move that let's clean that up here we go that's all sorted you know what was their response because again you know this plays into the role that that child plays within their identity So when you have, um, it's quite funny, I did something called motivational intelligence training. And it's what I've got a company that's within leadership as well. And they talk about the difference between people who are successful and people who are not. And one of the main differences is actually the way that our brain works. So we've obviously got the reptilian brain, um, which, you know, talks about uh, the fight or flight system. So whether we need to go ahead and, you know, act in some sort of way, we have the mammalian brain over the top of that, which is the emotional. And then we have the neocortex, which is all about the language that we're using within that situation. So if you have a child that's being told, what have you done? So as soon as they do anything wrong or something goes wrong, their fright and flight system is going to act very differently So they're going to go into fear. They're going to go into threat mode. When you go into that mode, you're not seeing opportunities. You're seeing all the problems. Then you add the feelings to it. Oh, gosh, I'm not good enough. Oh, the shame, the guilt, the fear, all those, or the anger, whatever it might be. And then that creates a story of that situation. So, you know, you can have a fact of, um, you know, a glass has fallen over and spilt water everywhere or whatever it might be, or red wine everywhere or whatever. With a person that's grown up with someone who's been highly critical of every bit, every bit, every bit of their behavior, they're going to see that as something that's a huge event, really bad, terrible, and it's all their fault and this, that, and the other. The person who's grown up and there's been like, whoops, you know, never mind, just sort it out. 
they're going to have that proactive approach where they're going to see the opportunities. Right, okay, we need to go and grab that, da-da-da-da-da, done. And it's not influencing their identity as much as that person. So if you've got someone like that going into a relationship where they're like, oh, you know, seeing all the threats and seeing all the criticisms, they're going to go into that relationship and go, oh, it's all my fault. I need to be responsible for this. The reason I've gone through all these relationships, you know, all my fault. And they tend to go into one or two categories. They tend to be the highly submissive person in the relationship where they'll try and people please. Or they'll go into the over controlling state where they'll try and control the whole relationship for it to go well. So you have someone who you end up basically in each of those scenarios with a parent child relationship versus two equals showing up together and building a life together. Nice. (laughs) Nice. Very well explained. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess, I guess I was conceptualizing of something really specific. That's more of a subtle behavior and reaction of of an adult that also encompasses a lot of body language Mm -hmm. and do they get agitated? Their shoulders come up and do they get tight? And does their face and eyes get angry and, oh no, you spilled the water, you know, whatever <laughs> happened, you spilled the water. But, or are they, just like you said, relaxed, body language doesn't change. They see it for what it is, right? Cause mm-hmm. life is short and the things that, things that don't matter don't matter. And mistakes happen. We're all human. Like, like, like we just said, people are a hot mess. So that's, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I know. And they're very insightful. Thank you. Definitely. I think for everyone listening, some good insights to think about, you know, how, what was our, what were our childhood experiences like and how could that be influencing our relationships? I know you, you talk a lot about body language too, which is something that I have a strong interest in. I think it's really impactful and people, when we interact with them, absorb a lot of data about who we are and how they evaluate us from our body language. So mm-hmm. is it someone who makes me feel safe around them? Do I feel like I can relax and be in a more comfortable state or do their, does their expression and how they're standing and where their arms are and their shoulders and their chest, is it really tight and intense and makes me think, okay, this person is about to explode. <laughs> like it's so much more simpler than that which is which is quite fun actually so for example if you wanted to make a really good impression when you say hello to someone it's really simple raise your eyebrows because what it does is it goes I recognize you I'm safe around you and we do that when we're when we're um you know excited to see someone so it's mm-hmm. literally open eyes you know eyebrows raised and also you know having your hands out you know sort of you know where someone can see them because if you're doing that with your hands behind your back it can make things awkward but one of the real simple ways of understanding if you're aligned with someone or not is looking if you're matching your body language together so Mm -hmm. it's like okay you both sit in there with your arms crossed because people think, oh, arms crossed means that you're you're um, disengaged and you're blocking someone off. It's not that at all. It's really not. So, um, you know, you can have people crossing their arms and having a fun, fantastic conversation together. Um, uh, you can have people, you know, both having their legs crossed. If you've got that matching um, in body language, it shows that you've got rapport there. So one of the fun things I love to go and do when I go to cafes or restaurants and stuff and I see couples, I can literally see just by seeing if they're matching their body language or not, um, if they're in a good state in their relationship or not. And the other one as well is if you watch people drinking, they will actually drink at the same time or similar times. So you'll have one person pick up their glass and the other person picking up their glass literally a couple of seconds later. And it's similar as well. Of um, I don't know if you've ever tried this. I've got a dog. And if I yawn around my dog, my dog will yawn with me. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is that's a pattern of what dogs actually have with their owners. So if, there, if there's good rapport there, people are exactly the same. You think about when you yawn around people and we're, we're around family mm-hmm. or friends, everyone's suddenly blinking yawns. And it's because of that level of rapport. Nice. That That's a cool... Yeah, because you you evaluate. You, you said earlier about the six minute evaluation. So, is there are there some body language components in that? 
So with the six minute profiling, so you can, there's so many different ways you can profile someone. It's just insane. So you can even just do it from language. You can do it from, um, what they wear, what they dress. You can do it from the way that they interact with people. Um, there's literally so many different ways. You can just literally profile some of them from a phone call. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of different ways to be able to do it. <laughs> and this, this body of research that you referenced that Chase brought, is this something that he had access to through previous work or – yeah, so he, he actually yeah. worked and trained the military. So all the research is his research that was funded by the U.S. government. Oh, uh, okay, nice. Yeah. And is he, was he like coming from a, I guess a professional, like a corporate background or academic or how did he get to that point? Yeah, military. So he was in the military all his life growing up and, um, yeah, we obviously worked his way up through the, through the ranks mm-hmm. and actually taught people to a Jason Bourne level to, uh, <laughs> like, literally, I'm not even, I'm, I, I've went on a few of his, um, training courses and was mentored by him for a year. But when I went to Virginia beach, you know, I was around people who would turn around to me and say, your shoulder moved half a millimeter. What was going on there? And they're literally, yeah, yeah. You know, (laughs) you go on a training with people like that who are looking at things like blink rate, looking at the way your hands are, looking at all these different things. I mean, the funny thing is I was zooped up to a um, polygraph machine, you know, a lie detecting machine. And, you know, I actually got taught how to fool a polygraph machine, which is quite fun. But the thing is, the people who were sitting there watching – who learn all the profiling and the body language stuff could read me better than a polygraph machine could. And that's how like insane and how accurate this, Mm -hmm. this level of um, profiling and body language is. Like they were also evaluating if you were being truthful. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It was really, really cool. Very, very fun experience. But the reason, like, I know a lot of people are going to go, oh, gosh, but we do need that in a relationship and this, that, and the other. The truth is it's more about the connection part. If you learn how to communicate better with people, you learn how to connect better with people too. So it's almost like the, you know, like the little jumps between um, a message to a phone call. You know, it's something you get so much more from a phone call because you've got the tonality and the voice and the way they're saying things and the accents and all those different things. Then when you see someone in person, you're able to say hello and actually see the way they move the body, if there's chemistry and this and the other. With the profile, it's almost like seeing that in HD. It's the another, it's the other jump from that. You know, you don't have to worry about um, if someone says they're fine or not and knowing how to read that. You're going to know if they're pissed off way before that conversation. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Also, um, the other thing that was really important to me was when I started my company, I found out that um, obviously the UK is a small place, but two women in the UK every week were getting killed by their partners or ex-partners. And I think it was one in three women and one in four men in the u.s that actually been in physically abusive relationships it's like hello we know more than you know three or four people but it's this topic that no one talks about and also shows like how many damaging relationships out there because it's one thing to have an argument we're all going to have arguments conflicts and all those different things but things to get to that physical level is rather scary when you think about how many physically abusive relationships have been out there so it's So it's basically helping people to, you know, obviously avoid those type of relationships, you know, through the profiling, through compatibility, through also communication, because I think not everyone knows how to have a conflict or have a disagreement and actually, you know, come out of that better and stronger as a couple. Totally. Yeah. And good, good for you. Good on you for embarking on that and acknowledging that there are a lot of abusive people out there and I think it's a good pivot over towards the the takeaways for men and the men listening about body language and safe dating. I know that's something that you obviously have a lot of expertise on. So what are some of the, the things you think that men should be more aware of when it comes to dating women that they may be doing that are putting women in an uncomfortable position? Yeah, I think 
So I'll sort of do a couple of points. I think obviously check out things like body language because that will definitely give you a cue of whether someone's into you or not. So you can have a look at a few different things. So you can have a look if they're matching their body language with you. You can also see where their feet are pointing to because if they're pointing towards you, that's usually a good sign. If it's pointing towards the door, that's usually their <laughs> indication to run. And you think like, literally when you look at people's feet, you can see if they're actually in the conversation or not. So if you have one person's foot facing you and the other foot facing the door, it's showing actually they're looking to lean towards walking out versus talking to you. So that can be a really, really good way to see if someone's actually open to to talking to you or not. And I think another really good one as well is you can see if someone's attracted to you in a few different ways. So obviously you can th- see things like pupil dilation. So that's when your pupils get bigger. Or you can see something called wing dilation. So when someone's highly aroused or attracted to someone, their nostrils will actually flare. So when mm. they're talking, you'll actually notice that there's there's flaring of the nostrils. And the other side of things that's really good as well is checking out the hands. So if someone's feeling comfortable around you, their hands are actually going to have their fingers extended. If someone's not feeling comfortable, their fingers will actually attract into their palms automatically. And the other side as well, if we see people actually doing stop, even if they're laughing, we actually mean stop. Right. So it's like, it's not that... So it's the funny thing is I can be talking to you and having a bit of a laugh and stuff and doing that. For the audio, you're putting your hands up in front of you. Yeah. (laughs) And (laughs) you can be joking around and and playing around with it and not even saying anything. But if someone's showing their palms to you, that's a huge, like, stop, don't come near me or anything like that, even if the language is, like, laughy, jokey and all those different things. So it's just being aware of that body language. I think, yeah, do you know, I'll jump a little bit further as well. We've got main arteries. So when we're completely afraid or shocked or anything like that, the first thing we do is we tuck our head in. (laughs) Our um, our veins in our wrists are are close to us. Our shoulders are up by our ears to uh, to protect our neck. You know, yeah, we literally crawl in. Mm -hmm. So if we find um, someone protecting their arteries... So, for example, we suddenly see their shoulders raise up or we suddenly see their, their, you know, their arms being close into them. That's going to give you an idea that that person isn't feeling comfortable around you. So sometimes if you can just start to do a joke or ask a question, you can actually watch someone's body language open up a lot more easily. So you're able to have a more connected conversation. Nice. Interesting. So those things all sound subconscious to me as well Mm -hmm. so these are things that the person on the surface might not feel comfortable saying to you get away from me you freak (laughs) (laughs) but their body will tell you the body knows yeah 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 Yeah. because we can't we can't control it like even if i went and grabbed a you know someone who is highly trained in body language and deception and all those different things it wouldn't matter if I asked them a question they lied to me. I'd still see it through their body language because you can't control your body. You physically can't do it, especially that like the further away a part of your body is from your head, it's harder to control. So, for example, if someone's really focusing on, um, uh, you know, preventing their breathing doing something different or preventing their blink rate doing something different, that's going to stop if even if they can control it. But their feet, their legs... Their fingers might be doing something completely different where they can't have right. that control over it. They're going to be twitching and... <laughs> twitching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Wow. Well, this is really interesting stuff. And thank you so much for these insights. Where can people find more about your coaching if they're interested and, and want to either educate themselves or talk to you? 
Yeah, sure. So um, uh, the best place to go would be our website. So it's lovewithintelligence.com. We've got a few different trainings on there at the moment. They're completely free. So we've got one around meeting the one. So we go through compatibility, um, how to get that sort of committed relationship and move it on to a healthy relationship. And we've also got another one about um, healing from narcissistic relationships as well and how narcissistic relationships work. Awesome. We'll pivot over to the uh, the three things game here. The cool. So, what month is your birthday in? February. February. Okay. Mm-hmm. So your birthday is coming up before mine. So you're gonna get a question. Okay. So what are the three things that you've learned from spending time alone? Oh, love that question. Okay. So I would say number one that we we stop ourselves from feeling by just doing things all the time. So it's like, okay, well, like if I find that I'm on my own, it's like, okay, all of a sudden I can feel more things coming up. I've got the focus fully on myself without trying to numb through being busy or being around people, or whatever it might be. The second one, I am such an empath. So to the point where <laughs> I like <laughs> someone will walk into my house, like it's quite funny. My partner and uh, my sister have like been the recent ones where I turn around and say, like, are you feeling something in your chest? Are you feeling a little bit anxious? And I'd literally pick that up. And um, so it's made me a lot more aware of other people's emotions and um, understanding what's mine and what's theirs. That's been really, really interesting. And I think the third one is how important connection is. Like we all need it. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm. we can't be hermits all our lives. And I think I personally, I'm quite a mix of introverted and extroverted. I can go and enjoy an awesome seminar, an event and be extroverted for a week or something like that. And then I'll literally need about a month. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, right, okay. I don't need anyone near me right now but I think um but I think it is it does make you realize how important connection is in terms of um you know being around people and that you can learn so much about people and yourself when you're around them totally mm. how do you how do you monitor your own emotions yeah is that's a good one I think the most important thing is actually giving yourself the space to sit and stop and if I turn around to someone and said right you know I want you to literally sit in a room for a whole day don't touch social media don't don't touch your phone you're not allowed to contact anyone or reach out to anyone how does that feel and most people will be like oh that's terrifying so it's like okay well starting point you know I never get anyone to do that FYI but the starting point is being able to actually sit with yourself and actually have that connection with yourself because so many people love to keep busy love pe- so many people love to um you know whether it's eating food drinking alcohol or constantly talking to people all the time or watching tv people numb and it, what it does is it damages the connection that you have with yourself and you can only connect to someone as deeply as you are connected to yourself so what i tend to find is If people aren't fully feeling into their emotions and what they're feeling, they'll project it on other people. So it's like, oh, I'm angry. And it's like, okay, why can I be angry at this person? Versus, okay, why is that that anger popped up? Or whatever that emotion might be. Because what we do... (laughs) <laughs> we're not going too deep we're like going on like a complete tangent is <laughs> like you know we talk about the reptilian brain the mammalian brain the neocortex well the when we take in information it'll go to the emotional part of the brain we'll feel the emotion and then we'll put the words to it so it's like okay feeling angry where's the anger coming from and we'll look for the reason in the external things of why we're feeling angry about a situation so we can end up projecting emotions or blaming people for, for the the emotions that you're feeling that's got nothing to do with them. <laughs> right. right. So, right. Yeah, that's awesome. So basically giving yourself time and space to feel, feel. what's happening. Yeah. Feel. I feel that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's my question. What are three things you have learned about anger? Mm. I like, I like this one too. I've had this one on the show before. Let me think how I can update it or say something different. I don't know. Recently, I've been feeling, number one, that 
I don't know, I'm not an angry person, you know, in, in your evaluation of me. I, I hope you have seen that. I'm a pretty, <laughs> pretty mellow angry. person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I feel this is kind of my conditioning from where in the country in the U.S. I grew up. I'm more conflict prone, you would think, perhaps. And I don't know, it's good. Sometimes it's good because, I, you know, I can speak up and... and like yesterday, we saw this guy who like looked like he was really obviously breaking into a car. Like he had a wire pick and was hooking, trying to get a door unlocked. And I confronted him. I was like, "What are you doing? Is that your car?" You know. So I feel like that's a, a positive example of like, you know, there are like the whole bystander effect. Like there are situations yeah. where someone needs to step up. But also, I've been in situations where I say something and I look like a, look like a fool because, like, we were at the airport and. We were waiting in line and a few, a few people had like cut us in line. Mm. And then eventually this, this woman came up and I, and I was like, excuse me, ma'am. Like there's all, there's a whole line here. And she, her name had been called to come up to the front, you know? So like, <laughs> I mean, I'm an idiot, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, and I have to apologize. I think that's so, the biggest I don't know. ownership of it. It's like, I think that's like yeah. the important part. It's like if you suddenly said, "Oh no, a stupid woman," <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and there she walk up to the front with her name being called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess number one would be anger is good, but it really, I guess that would be a takeaway. I, be re- I have to be ready to accept the consequences of it. You know, if, if I lean into it and I feel like it's a good, it's a good thing to stand up for, that's great. But also. They're gonna, they're gonna be consequences. Number two, I think anger in a relationship to stick to the theme of today is really not great. And I think that communicating with my partner, especially that's a lot of her feedback is, you know, I understand that like you like to get fired up, but when we're communicating about our relationship, please don't raise your voice or bring that tone because we can, we can talk about these topics and you can, when you disagree with me, you can disagree with me and communicate it in a way that's not angry. Even if you're right, you you know, you're so, if you're feeling so correct and you feel like you're in the right, you can still do that in a way that's not going to be angry or unhealthy communication. So that's, that's a good takeaway. Nice. And then, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I would say <laughs> I came to that reflection after talking to you. And number three, I would, you know, get angry people. Also, there's a lot to be angry about in the world. I'm not like, I, I am on a bit of a, not, I wouldn't say like social justice. Oh yeah. So, I mean, social justice is part of the show and a lot of, a lot of episodes and that has, that has downsides too. But I do think that, you know, if somebody has the emotional capacity to care about an issue or to care about, other people do it because there are a lot of causes and people that need a little bit of a boost so if you have that fire in you to do something go go and do it that would be my my third one nice go and use it in a positive way (laughs) yes (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) awesome well lily thanks so much i'll link to your your website lovewithintelligence.com Thank you for the information. I'm going to really enjoy going back and listening to this because there's a lot of really uh, great nuggets of info in the in the conversation. Oh, thank you. No, I've really enjoyed this. So thank you for having me on. For sure. Good luck to you and your business. All the best. You too. Thank you. You got it. Bye. <laughs>